Hey class, welcome back. We're going to now uh, continue our lecture of chapter seven, talking about work and energy and some of its applications. Um, in particular, we are going to talk about uh, work done by an inconsistent force and also talk about power. All right, so as we've uh, been doing everything so far in this chapter, we've assumed that the force stays the same. So we just say, okay, work is equal to force multiplied by displacement. That's true provided that the force is constant. But not all forces are constant. There's often times that a force changes with time or changes especially with displacement. So you could represent this like you see in these different graphs here. So if you have a situation where you have a variable force or a changing force, you can no longer just multiply the force by the distance to get work because which force do you multiply, right? You multiply the force down here, the force in the middle, the force up here, right? You're not sure. You could look at the force at various different locations and multiply that by the little delta x as you see down here at the bottom to find the area of these little triangles. That'd give you a good approximation. But what you really want when you're looking at the work is actually the area under the force versus displacement curve. You want this area shown here. And so when you think about area under the curve, hopefully by now you know to think about calculus, right? So if you were to take those little triangles, add them all up, and take it so that those delta x's get really, 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 really small, just like in calculus, what you would end up be doing is taking the limit as your delta x goes to zero of the force, average force over that period, multiplied by the delta x. And you add up all those little rectangles as they get tinier and tinier, and really what you end up doing is integrating. So the work done by a variable force with respect to x is really just the area under the force displacement curve or expressed as an integral the work is equal to the integral of the force function of that graph dx from some initial x location to some final location so that is how we define work and since this is in the x direction you could have work in the y or z direction so the total overall network being done on your system is just the sum of the integrals in the x, y, and z direction. Okay, and so if there's no force parallel uh, to the direction, for example, dy, if there's no force in the y direction, then there's no force doing work, so that would become zero, um, and so on. But the work, again, is just going to be the integral of force multiplied by displacement. Okay, so um, I have an example problem that I'm going to do in a separate video since it'll take a little longer and I want to write it out. So you can check that out um, as well on, on YouTube. But this is a different way of calculating work, but everything else we talked about earlier in the chapter all still applies. Okay, the work kinetic energy theorem still applies. Work still equals change in kinetic energy. None of that has changed. So now to talk about and observe how this idea of a variable force works with work, <laughs> all right, I want to talk about one example of a variable force, a force that changes with displacement, and that is the force due to a spring, okay? So you've probably seen springs. Uh, I used to have a trampoline when I was a kid. We'd jump up and down on it as this big piece of fabric, and around it were probably, I don't know, 20 to 30 different springs, all right? And as we pushed down, those springs stretched out, and the more those springs stretched, the tighter they were pulling and the more I was thrown upward, okay? Similar to something like a Nerf gun. I don't know if you've had Nerf guns, but with different Nerf guns, the further you pull back, the further it's able to shoot. And other things like uh, for my wife's birthday recently, I bought her a bow, uh, bow and arrow to shoot kind of just for fun in the backyard. Well, the bow, the further back you pull, the more force it takes to hold it back, all right? If you pull it just a little bit, there's not that much force. If you pull it back, you know, a whole meter, then there's much more force. And so the amount of force is dependent on the amount you pull it back. And it obeys a direct relationship, and we'll talk about this uh, more as well in later chapters, but it obeys something known as Hooke's Law. And Hooke described this relationship for springs and other spring-like um, objects such as the bow and so on, and he said that springs obey a linear relationship, meaning that the force is going to be equal to negative k multiplied by the displacement or the distance that that spring is moved away from its equilibrium point. All right, so d here is the distance away from equilibrium. 
Now, if you have a spring, right, a spring always has some set length that it starts at. It's not counting that length. It's just how far away from its original length it's stretched, okay? So if I had, you know, one that's, let's say, this big, maybe 10 centimeters, if I stretch it out to 15 centimeters, D would just be the 5 centimeter difference, all right? Another thing that people get confused by here is this negative sign. Why is there a negative sign? All that represents is direction. What that means is if I pull a spring to my right, as you see here, the force that the spring exerts is going to be in the opposite direction, to the left. It's trying to pull it back towards equilibrium. So that means whatever direction it's stretched, the force is always going to be trying to pull it back in the opposite direction that it is stretched. And so that's why there is that negative sign. Okay, that's all that means. Don't get confused. Things like spring constant, those are constant positive value. It will never be negative. All right, so the negative sign is just about the direction of the force relative to the direction of the displacement. All right, so spring constant, the K is what's known as a spring constant. It's just a measure of the stiffness of a spring. The units for spring constant are typically newtons per meter. So that's telling you, all right, if something has a spring constant of 500, that means it will take 500 newtons of force to stretch that spring a distance of one meter. So that tells you, again, the amount of force required to stretch it a given distance. Okay, so cool. And so here's Hooke's law. If you're just acting in one dimension along the x-axis, the force in the x-axis is just negative k times x. So what does this have to do with work? This is just all an introduction to the spring force. whoop de doo right? Well, we can figure out the work being done by a spring. A lot of people want to say, oh, force equals negative kx. Work is force times distance, so negative kx times x. That's just going to be negative kx squared. No, that's wrong, okay? It's wrong because the force varies. If you are pulling it back one meter, you're going to have a given force. If you pull it down back two meters, and now it's supplying or requiring double the amount of force. I say supplying or requiring. I hope that doesn't confuse you. What I mean is if I pull it, let's say I pull it five centimeters, I have to supply a certain force to stretch it. And because of Newton's third law, the spring is pulling back on me an equal and opposite amount. I pull another five meters to 10 or centimeters to 10 centimeters. I've now stretched it twice as far, so it requires twice as much force for me to pull, but it's pulling back now with the same twice as much force as well, okay? So again, that negative sign means the spring's pulling back against me in the opposite direction. All right, so let's figure this out. Again, work equals the integral of force times dx, right? And so we can integrate the force, negative kx, so I put the negative in here just to drive it home to you, all right, but what it's going to look like is the integral of negative kx in here. If you integrate negative kx from x initial to x final dx, what you're going to get is negative one-half kx evaluated from x final to x initial, so you have negative one-half kx final squared minus a negative one-half k initial squared, so that minus one-half becomes a positive one-half kx initial. So this looks backwards to a lot of people because usually you think of final minus initial. This is initial minus final because of that negative nature of a spring. So this is the work being done by the spring. It's going to want to pull you back in the opposite direction of your displacement. So if you pull a spring, okay, the spring is doing negative work because it's pulling against the direction of displacement all the time. That's why you see it expressed in this manner. All right, so again, the work can be positive or negative depending on which direction the spring is moving. So if you pull, if a spring becomes stretched out, the spring is doing negative work. It's working against that. If it starts stretched and is released and goes inward, then it's going to do positive work, giving something kinetic energy in towards its center. All right, so again, if you start at a zero position, if it's not uh, displaced at all, then the work done by spring is going to be negative because it's working against the displacement. It wants to be at that equilibrium. It wants to be at zero, and so any work being done to move it away, it's going to work against that, hence the negative sign. All right, so switching gears, I now want to talk about power. So what is power, all right? Well, power is really the rate at which work is being done, okay? So it's really looking at 
the rate at which you're doing work or the rate at which energy is being expended or something along those lines, okay? So a lot of times people get confused about this because you think of power, you think of, you know, oh, your power bill. The power bill is how much energy you use in a given month or something. That's not actually true. The power bill is inaccurately named. It should be called your energy bill because they're charging you based on the amount of energy you're using, not the rate at which you consume energy, okay? So if you hear about something like a power bill, which should be called an energy bill, it would have units of something like kilowatt hours. So kilowatts or watts are a unit that we use to measure power, okay? And then it's multiplying that by hours. Kilowatts times hours actually give you units of joules, okay? So you'd end up with different numbers of joules, which is what you're paying for, which is energy. So what is power? Well, exactly what it sounds like. It's the amount of work, the rate at which you're Expending work, so it's just going to be work divided by time, will give you your average power. Okay, so since it's work, joules divided by time, well, the units are watts. All right, so if you ever can't remember, you just think to yourself, what are the units for power? Oh, yeah, watts, got it, boom, piece of cake, right? So one watt is one joule per one second. All right, so those are the units we use for power. And again, it's the rate at which you're consuming energy. So kilowatt hours are watts times hours, they give you joules, all right? So power again, change in energy over change in time. Other units that you'll see sometimes for power in addition to watts, you can see horsepower, all right? One horsepower, which dates back to when horses would uh, pull carriages and be used in work and different things like that. Uh, is One horsepower is equal to 740, 5.7 watts, which is also equal to about 550 foot-pounds per second. So just to show you, uh, in addition to that, there's uh, another way you can express power. So again, remember power equals work over time, right, or change in energy over time. Work is force multiplied by distance or displacement, assuming they're in the same direction, right? So power can be thought of as force times displacement over time. And look at this. Remember, Average velocity, right, that's change in position over change in time. So you, you can think of average velocity as just being, yeah, displacement over time. So you can substitute velocity in here. And another way to quantify average power for a constant force is just going to be equal to that constant force multiplied by the average velocity. So that's an additional way to quantify power as well. So I want to do a quick example problem for you all before kind of wrapping up this chapter. Some more complex examples will be posted online in addition to this, but this is just to give you a brief introduction. All right, so one way to produce energy, all right, is using dams. Hydroelectric power is a big part of Oregon's energy, all right? So let's imagine that there's a river, they dam it up, and so there's a dam, and let's say that you have these large turbines that are used to harness the energy from the water and turn it into electrical energy that can be used in your house. So we're gonna make some assumptions. This is very optimistic, but anyway, that's okay. So let's say that approximately uh, 57,000 kilograms of water are gonna be falling a distance of 19 meters through the turbines. Now let's imagine and dream that we have super efficient uh, turbines in here. And so we can harness one half of the total work done by gravity on the water and turn it into electrical energy. That's super high, 50%. Um, it's probably much lower than that, but we're just going to use it for a nice round number. So half of the overall work being done by gravity on the water will be used or harnessed into electrical energy. So my question is twofold. One, what's the power being generated at these turbines? Okay, assuming that all 57,000 kilograms of water are passing through our turbines. And the second is, if these were running around the clock for an entire 24-hour period, how much energy would be produced during that day? So let's give this a go, okay? Hopefully you've, you pause it, you give it a go. If not, um, pause it now. But I'm going to go ahead with the solution, okay? So let's start tackling part A. How much power is being generated? So we know power is work multiplied, or excuse me, work divided by time. What is work? Well, the work here is the work being done by gravity. As we learned back in the last video, work done by gravity is independent of path, so it's just gonna be equal to the weight of the water multiplied by the height through which it falls, regardless of the path. 
So that's going to be MGH. But we're told, again, only one half of the total work is able to be harnessed. So I have to divide that by 2. And so my work is just MGH over 2. And so if I plug that in, the power is just going to be MGH over 2 divided by T. So writing that in a more appropriate way, you have MGH over 2T. Plugging in my values given in the problem statement, I find that the power of these generators is approximately 5.31 times 10 to the 6th power watts. Quite a lot, right? So 5.36 megawatts would be another way of writing that. Quite a bit. So the second question asks us how much energy is produced in a single day. Well, again, power is work over time, right? So work is just power multiplied by time. So we know that our time is one day, 24 hour period. So if we take our work and multiply it by 24 hours, or in this case, 86,400 seconds, you would find that the work done is 4.59 times 10 to the 11th power joules. That's an immense amount of energy being produced. That's enough to power my house for like an entire month or a couple months or something. I don't know, quite a bit. So yeah, no messing around. Box worthy once again. Okay, so that pretty much wraps things up. Um, just a, two last quick slides. One, here you see a table kind of giving you an idea of different powers uh, generated by average humans. This is for like a, a healthy young 70 kilogram male. It varies based on your, your size and your age and different things. But just sleeping, you're burning through 77 joules of energy every second. So you're burning calories just sleeping, boy howdy. Okay, you can see walking around, biking, skiing, running, all of these different things burn significant uh, amounts of joules of energy every second. And then the last thing, so we said power is work over time, right? But we just said average power is the total work over the time. That's an average value. To get instantaneous power, you just take the derivative of work with respect to time, again, using calculus. So that wraps things up for chapter seven. Have yourselves a box-worthy day, and we'll see you for some sample problems a little bit later.